Hi, this is Professor Kreider, and this is the labor and delivery content that um, is being developed for you and in lieu of a lecture day because of our good old-fashioned Ohio weather. So um, this content correlates with the content that's in your textbook, but it's the information that I would be presenting to you in class. These are the objectives that we have for patients in the labor and delivery environment. You want to protect the life of mom and baby. We want to support normal labor and detect and treat complications in a timely fashion. We want to identify them you know, as quickly as possible and, and implement treatment. We want to support and respond to the needs of the woman, her partner, and her family during the labor and delivery process. We really want the patient to be able to verbalize and understand what is occurring um, and in relationship to labor and delivery and obviously any complications that might be developing and what we're doing with her delay with her delivery process we want her to be able to verbalize any anxieties and fears that she has during this process a lot of times patients come to this experience especially like first-time moms who've not had a baby before and they're a little nervous or anxious about what's going to happen what their pain level is going to be like and what the expectations are so we want them to be able to verbalize uh, their feelings regarding this and we want the patient to be able to effectively cope during um, the labor and delivery process. There are some issues for new, new nurses and students in this environment and the first one being working with patients who are in pain. In other parts of the hospital you know pa pain is considered the fifth vital sign and there's a lot of interventions to that are um, put into place to try to address a patient's pain level. I'm not saying that we don't address a patient's pain level in labor and delivery, but we do understand it's a part of the normal process. So we really support what mom chooses to do. If mom chooses to, to engage in um, natural labor and does not want to have um, any intervention for, play, for pain, we will support her. Obviously, if mom wants to have some type of um, intervention, such as an epidural or maybe some medications, we will give those to her and um, support her her um, choice. We also have to understand that this can play, how a patient understands what's happening can be a little bit of an adjustment for them. And what I mean by this is, if this is mom's first baby, or she had a negative experience prior to um, the delivery that you're working with her on, that might color her experience in the delivery that you're having now. What I mean by that is, if she had a negative experience previously, like maybe let's say something bad happened, like she had a fetal demise, or there was a problem with the baby, or she experienced a lot of pain, um, that can color her current experience and so you may have to work with um, and that may be adjustment for you working with a patient who has had those experiences as well as your own experience if you've had some difficulties with uh, patients in this environment or had some problems that are that you know arise or complications it can be an issue for you as you're working with your current patient another factor for adjustment is the unpredictable nature of the labor and delivery environment and then how labor and delivery is such an intimate setting. All of these factors really require an adjustment for new nurses and students working in this particular clinical environment. When we talk about the intrapartum care, we're talking about the care of the patient from the beginning of regular contractions to shortly after the birth of the baby. There are different theories as to how this process begins. Now, there these theories have different names, and I'm going to present both for you. You have the oxytocin theory, the progesterone deprivation theory, the prostaglandin theory, and the fetal endocrine control theory. Remember that these are just theories. I actually prefer the other terminology for this because I think students understand this content a little better. First being the oxytocin theory, also known as oxytocin stimulation theory. Yes, pregnancy um, comes closer to term, the uterus will become more sensitive to oxytocin. In addition, as, as um, pregnancy progresses, the baby is going to drop further into mom's pelvis and there's going to be some pressure that is put on her cervix by the fetus and that pressure that is put on the 
um, the cervix by the fetus will cause um, some oxytocin to be released. It sends a message to our brain to release oxytocin. And you from your previous lecture content should understand now that oxytocin will cause the uterus to contract. You also have the progesterone withdrawal theory and the estrogen stimulation theory. I like you to think of estrogen and estro uh, progesterone on a scale. And on one end you have progesterone and on the other end you have estrogen. You need progesterone to maintain a pregnancy. And as pregnancy progresses, the amount of progesterone that is found in mom's body will decrease. At the same time, her estrogen level will increase. You, estrogen, you want to understand, estrogen increases uterine contractility. And so um, as progesterone decreases, it allows the estrogen level to increase. So the hormone that is supporting pregnancy decreases and the hormone that is um, that causes or related to uterine contractility, estrogen will increase. You also have the fetal cortisol theory or the fetal steroidal theory, same name for this process, where you have changes in the um, biochemistry of the fetal membrane, which causes a decrease in progesterone and an increase in prostaglandins in the placenta. This is important because prostaglandins increase uterine contractility and also cause the cervix to soften. You have distension. As pregnancy progresses, the uterine muscles become stretched and that causes an increase in the release of prostaglandins. And remember, prostaglandins increase uterine contractility. In addition, the amniotic sac makes an acid which is a precursor to prostaglandin, which will also increase uterine contractility. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we just discussed, you have progesterone and estrogen. Progesterone um, maintains pregnancy and inhibits contractility, and estrogen increases contractility. So as mom comes closer to term, you have a shift in this balance where you have a decrease in her progesterone um, found in her body and an increase in her estrogen level. High estrogen level and low progesterone uh, ratio will incite the uterus or cause uterine contractility. This is just a picture of the fetal steroidal theory that I just explained to you where you have substances released by the fetal adrenal glands that are precursors to prostaglandins and will cause more prostaglandins to be um, secreted. This is the oxytocin theory. I have a better picture. I, I like this one for um, explaining this concept simply, but I think the second picture I'm about to show you may help you a little more. And this is the oxytocin theory. Remember, as pregnancy progresses and we're getting closer to term, the head of the fetus will put pressure on mom's cervix, um, which is the terminal end of mom's uterus, and that causes some pressure on the the cervix and that will send a message or an impulse to our hypothalamus which signals the posterior pituitary gland to release oxytocin. The posterior pituitary gland will release this oxytocin and the oxytocin will travel in her bloodstream to the uterus and the uterus is going to respond by contracting more vigorously. Those contractions increase dilatation of the cervix and stimulate more release of oxytocin, which cause the baby to come down a little further, and which puts more pressure and sends another message to mom's brain. So if that kind of helps you picture um, that theory, that's what's happening. When we look at the initiation of labor, we talked about the different theories, the progesterone, estrogen, oxytocin, prostaglandin uh, theories. We'll get to um, the influence of mom's psyche a little bit later in this content. And we talked about the fetal cortisol or steroid theory. Let's talk about the artificial ways in which we can cause labor to, to occur. We can, on cervical exam, strip the membranes, which is kind of irritating the membranes, to encourage her amniotic sac to rupture. We can administer a gel vaginally, it's prostaglandin gel or a prostaglandin suppository, which causes the cervix to soften. The term for that is ripening the cervix. So we can insert that and allow that 
that prostaglandin gel to be absorbed. We can artificially rupture her membranes. We take a device that looks like a crochet hook and it will snag the amniotic sac and we will forcibly cause the amniotic sac to rupture. Um, during sexual intercourse, um, it, seam, uh, sperm are bathed in prostaglandin fluid and um, that can cause mom's cervix to, to soften. And then nipple stimulation, you should know that from our previous lecture, that causes the release of oxytocin. So this is showing you how we can artificially rupture mom's um, her amniotic sac where the baby is being held in utero. And it's where we take a device that looks like a crochet hook and they will snag the, uh, the amniotic sac and rupture her um, amniotic sac or bag of waters. <clears throat> Let's talk about the physiological effects of the birth process. They're both maternal and fetal responses to labor. Um, when you look at the maternal responses, there are significant changes that occur in her cardiovascular, respiratory, GI, urinary, blood, and reproductive systems. We're going to spend some time looking at these different changes and adaptations as they occur. <clears throat> We're going to start with the reproductive system. The uterus is really a pear-shaped, upside-down uh, muscular organ that has three layers. And I'm working from the inner to the outer if you're looking at this picture that's in front of you. The endometrium is the inner uh, lining which sheds each month when mom has her, you know, when a woman has her menstrual cycle. The um, myometrium, which is the inner layer is the more muscular layer and then you have the perimetrium which is the outer layer and it really just supplies, supplies support to the whole structure. But the uterus is going to contract during the course of the labor process and there's different characteristics of the contractions that we want to talk about. <clears throat> Normal labor contractions are coordinated, they're involuntary. You know early in pregnancy mom may experience some contractions, but those contractions are irregular and inf infrequent. But as she gets closer to term, those contractions are going to become more regular and more coordinated. The contractions are also involuntary. Mom cannot start or stop them by conscious effort, and they're intermittent. And it's important that they're intermittent. We'll talk about that when we get to fetal response to labor. <clears throat> So when you look at this picture, I'm actually showing you how the uterus contracts. The, uterus, the uterine contractions and labor are going to start in the fundus and spread throughout the uterus and mom's pelvic girdle really is where she's going to feel them. Um, but they start in the fundus and they propel the fetus downward. So really the uterus is pushing the fetus downward. When you look at coordinated contractions, the uterus can contract and relax in a very coordinated way during the process of labor. Um, as gestation nears term, those contractions really that mom is experiencing earlier become more organized. Early contractions in early labor are called Braxton Hicks contractions. But as she gets closer to term, those, those contractions, though she may not be in true labor yet, will become more organized and more regular. And during labor, contractions are going to assume a regular frequency, a regular duration, and a regular intensity. Coordinated labor contractions will begin in the uterine fundus and they spread, spread downward toward the cervix and they're propelling the fetus towards the pelvis. Again, the uterine contractions are involuntary. They, the patient can't stop or start them by conscious effort, but there are activities that may stimulate contractions such as walking. Keep in mind though, there are other factors that can affect, or in other influences I should say, that can influence mom's uterine contractions. And that includes stress and anxiety. As labor contractions are intermittent, that's important because we don't want them sustained. When the uterus contracts during labor, it squeezes the blood vessels um, and it squeezes the placenta and it squeezes the fetus. And so the baby needs short interruptions in these contractions because during the time that the uterus is relaxed, this allows blood flow to and from the placenta. So gas exchange, nutrients and waste uh, uh, exchange happen to and from the fetus. 
Each contraction consists of three phases. You have the increment, which occurs as the contraction begins in the fundus and spreads throughout the, the uterus. You have the peak, which is also known as the acne, which is the period during which the contraction is most intense. <clears throat> and then you have the decrement, which is the period of decreasing intensity as the uterus relaxes. The contraction cycle and overall pattern of the contraction are described in terms of frequency, duration, and intensity. Frequency is the period of the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next, and it's usually in expressed in seconds and minutes. Duration is the length of contractions from beginning to end of that same contraction. In addition, contractions are, um, when you're talking about intensity, it's the strength of each contraction. So they're mild, moderate, and strong, or strong. And as labor progresses, the frequency is going to increase, the duration is going to increase, and the intensity is going to increase. <clears throat> the interval is the period of time between the end of, of one contraction and the beginning of the next contraction. So this is a contraction cycle. And you can see here the increment, <clears throat> which is where the, the contraction is beginning to build, the peak, which is also known as the acme, which is the most intense portion of the, the uterine contraction, and then decrement as the, as the contraction is beginning to, um, to slowly, the uterus is beginning to relax and the contraction is beginning to relax and go away. And I t usually tell the students in class um, how I remembered this content is I always thought of um, the roadrunner and the coyote. So the acne is the most intense portion of the contraction. Frequency is the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next. Duration is the beginning and the end of that same contraction. And the interval is the resting phase. It's the period of time from the end of one contraction and before the beginning of the next. <clears throat> We're going to talk about how the baby responds to the contraction patterns. But I first want to explain to you that labor is given categories. And it's based on um, what we see. Um, normal labor is considered a category one, where you have a normal baseline, a normal fe heart, fetal heart rate pattern, you have moderate variability, and a lack of um, concerning decelerations. Um, so we're going to continue monitoring during normal labor, and that would be considered a category one. Category two is indeterminate, where we see some things that are concerning enough to warrant increased frequency and in monitoring, um, but and we will respond to interventions by providing either discontinuing Pitocin, look, maybe looking at do we need to expedite delivery, or, or what, do we need to you know do some intervention uh, because of some things that we see. <clears throat> And then you have what's called category three, which means abnormal labor. Um, some of examples of this could be absent um, baseline fetal heart rate variability. Um, you can have late or variable decelerations with a bradycardia or a sinusoidal pattern. Basically what this means is we really need to expedite um, delivery either vaginally or by C-section. We'll come back to this. <coughs> Excuse me. When you look at labor, labor equals uterine muscle activity. And in true labor, the uterus um, is divided by activity. The upper segment is active, it contracts, and it thickens as labor progresses. In the lower segment, the uterus is more passive, it thins and it expands as the cervix opens. And in between these two areas is a physiological contraction band. Normally do not see this band unless there is a problem. We come back to this in high risk. It's called Bandy's ring, but um, it is there, but it's normally, it's normally not an issue unless um, you have a complication that are complications that are developing. So these two opposing features as to how the uterus contracts, the upper two thirds of the uterus is contracting actively to push the fetus down and the lower one-third remains less active and it's thinning and opening and that really allows for the uterus to be uh, propelled downward 
Now this is not one continuous big move. This is slow incremental moves as the uterus contracts, slowly brings the, the fetus down. The uterine muscle, called the myometrium, and I showed you a picture of the, the layers of the uterus. That should make sense to you now. Um, the, the uterine cells in the myometrium contract and remain shortened. And um, the uterine muscle cells in the lower portion of the uterus become longer with each contraction. And these two opposing characteristics allow uh, for the maintenance of tension and preserve the cervical changes which are occurring in the process of labor and allow the fetus to progress downward. <clears throat> so in a nutshell, the uterus is kind of, in a way, pulling itself up over the baby. The upper portion of the uterus will become thicker while the lower portion will become thinner and pull upwards. These changes also assist with straightening the fetal body and effectively uh, direct the fetus downwards towards the pelvis. During the time that the uterus is contracting, the blood vessels to, to the placenta um, be, become contracted. And so gas exchange happens primarily during the interval in between uterine contractions when the uterus is relaxed so the contraction or the constriction that's being placed on these blood vessels um, relaxes. <clears throat> so this is what I mean when I say uterine blood flow is affected during uterine contraction. During the interval time, and you see this in your screen in green, you have normal blood flow. But during um, the increment, the peak, and the decrement, you have reduced blood flow, with the peak being even almost no blood flow. But all three of those phases, the increment, peak, and decrement, you have decreased blood flow to and from the fetus. It's important to assess how the baby is tolerating labor during this period of time. So during con severe contractions, um, there can be decreased blood flow, and if you have a baby who's not tolerating labor well, um, they can have, um, you can have fetal compromise, and the baby may have to, you know, be delivered in another way, such as um, having a C-section because they're not going to tolerate labor well. <clears throat> I'm going to go over some fetal heart rate information now. What I'm going over is abbreviated. There is more information in your textbook in specific, in specific reference to your interpartum procedures. Um, there is a handout in Blackboard, but that correlates to this lecture content. So um, it's primarily more so the information in your textbook and what I'm presenting with you. The handout that I'm talking about is the labor and delivery activity that you're going to do um, that might be helpful to you with this content. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> when you look at um, the, the, feet, the strips of paper that are coming out where we're looking at fetal heart rate monitoring and the uterine contractions at the top portion of the paper you're going to see the fetal heart rate response and at the bottom portion you're going to see the uterine activity, the uterine contractions. So the um, fetal heart rate tracing is displayed in the upper the upper pane and then you have the intervals between the red lines represents one minute. In between those red lines you have little boxes and there's six of them and each of them equal 10 seconds. So at the bottom of the screen you can see, or the bottom of this uh, strip, you can see the uterine contractions which are being pointed out to you. And at the top portion you can see the fetal heart rate. And if you kind of take a step back, you look at where the baby's heart rate is ha hanging out or averaging, that is called baseline. An increase from baseline is an acceleration, a decrease from baseline is a deceleration. <clears throat> so when you look at the, the fetal heart rate pattern, now this is a screen capture. In reality, the baby's heart rate can range from 110 to 160, but we like them to hang out between 120 and 160, but they can, if the baby's in a sleep cycle, their heart rate will drop. Think about what happens when you um, go to sleep, your heart rate drops. So baseline um, is looking at the preserved beat to beat 
um, at short term and long term variability. Where is my baby's heart rate hanging out? Do I have sudden increases from baseline? That's an acceleration. Sudden decreases from baseline is a deceleration. When you look at fetal tachycardia, it's sustained fetal heart rate that is greater than 160 beats per minute or greater for 10 minutes or longer. There are things that can be problematic here. It can be secondary to fetal hypoxia or <clears throat> or infection. Like if mom has an infectious process and she has a fever, the baby's inside of mom. So the baby can have um, a, an infectious process as well. There are certain medications that can cause this. Amniitis can cause this. We'll get into that in high risk. If there's um, hyperthyroidism or fetal anemia present, they can all um, be linked to fetal tachycardia. And this is what fetal tachycardia looks like on the fetal heart rate strip. Now, I want to talk to you about deceleration. Deceleration is the drop from baseline, from where the fetal heart rate is averaging. And the lowest point of the, the decrease from uh, baseline or the deceleration is called the nadar. You're going to look at the onset of the contraction the nadar, which is the lowest point, and when the baby's heart rate returns back to baseline or when it recovers, and compare that to the uterine contraction. <clears throat> there are different types of um, fetal responses that you can see. We talked about acceleration, we talked about deceleration. I want to talk to you about some others, including late deceleration and variable deceleration. But there's different there are differences in patterns that you can see. A deceleration is, remember, a drop from baseline. And I'm going to look at how this baby's heart rate is um, decelerating or responding in, in terms of a uterine contraction cycle. First thing I want to show you is late decelerations, where the baby's heart rate, the nadar, happens after the peak of the contraction. And you have... Um, you have the baby's heart rate that's down even into the interval period or the resting portion of the um, the contraction cycle, and that's important because this is where the blood flow to and from the fetus should be, is you know really good, and the baby's heart rate should be up and it should be you know recovered. The baby's heart rate is very quick to recover to slight changes, so. Um, a late deceleration really is pointing out that your baby is not really being adequately perfused, it's utero placental insufficiency. I, I showed you in class, more than likely, if I got to that point, I showed you what a late deceleration looks like. And I usually explain to students that um, it doesn't have to be a big drop. I sometimes will show a big dip on the board when I'm drawing this out but it's where it is in the contraction cycle. And as you can see, the nadar is happening in these instances in the, the resting phase of the contraction cycle in the interval. And that's telling you that this baby is not um, being adequately perfused, so you have utero placental insufficiency. Look at where the, the deceleration happens in the contraction cycle. <clears throat> this is a prolonged deceleration which is, um, and this is an actual fetal heart rate strip, so you can see what this looks like. Um, this is where the baby's heart rate is down for a significant period of time. If you look at this slide that I'm showing you, remember what I said to you about um, how long, how you count the minutes? So basically, this baby's heart rate is down for one, two, three, four, five, almost six minutes before the baby's heart rate starts to recover, and that's a significant um, period of time for the baby to, you know, have be having poor oxygenation. And so if this is occurring, what you more than likely will see is the nursing staff and the, the healthcare team really will huddle and they will quickly decide um, to expedite delivery, meaning the, the mom may have an emergency C-section. <clears throat> this is variable decelerations, which really means that the baby's heart rate is not is is down at variable periods of time but it's not the uterine contraction that's the catalyst for um, the deceleration in reality it's umbilical cord compression 
When you look at variable decelerations, they can ha happen with or without um, without the uterine contractions, and they are typically U-shaped or V-shaped. And they're an abrupt drop from, um, from baseline, whereas your late decelerations are a gradual drop. <clears throat> Let's talk about variability. Um, variability, you have both short-term and long-term variability, but you're looking at that blade-like grass appearance um, or characteristic to the fetal heart rate. You really want the baby to have good variability. You like them to have moderate variability. Absent variability is not a good finding, and neither is marked variability. Um, we we would like the baby to have at least minimal, but we prefer them to be you know moderate variability. And in this picture, I'm showing you that smooth wave-like appearance where you have the lack of the blade-like grass appearance to. Um, the fetal heart rate, but do you have this wave-like appearance? This is called sinusoidal pattern. This is considered an ominous sign. Um, basically, you have a baby who in utero may be anemic or you have a depressed central nervous system. There, there are other causes for this, but this is not usually considered a good finding. And kind of a way that I teach students to remember the different um, fetal deceleration patterns is I give them a little thing. <clears throat> it's called fetal chop. And so what I'm showing you is the fetal heart rate pattern and then what this means for the baby. So like variable deceleration means cord compression. Early decelerations mean head compression. Accelerations are okay. Um, and late decelerations mean placental insufficiency. We're going to move on to looking at the cervical changes that happen during the course of delivery. We're moving away from the fetal response. Now let's look at um, how the cervix is going to change during this process. And these are again some other things that we have to assess as the nurse. So we're going to look at effacement and dilatation. Effacement is the thinning and shortening of the cervix and dilatation is the opening or dilating of the cervix. <clears throat> effacement and dilatation can occur at different times but depending if mom has had a baby before or not you may see some slight differences. Typically speaking, a, a woman who has had a baby before will progress through these stages a lot faster. A nulliparous woman may efface early, but it may take a lot longer for her to completely um, progress through the stages of dilatation. When you look at effacement, it's really the shortening and, th and thinning of the cervix, and it's a progressive change that happens, and we describe this in terms of a percentage with 0 to 100 percent effacement. <clears throat> um, before labor, the cervix is really kind of a cylinder structure. It's approximately 2 centimeters long at the lower end of the, the, the cervix, excuse me, the lower end of the uterus, and the cervix is going to change as labor progresses. So as mom experiences some labor contractions, this is going to push the fetus. Remember I told you the contractions bring the fetus down and it's going to propel the fetus downward against the cervix and that helps the cervix then shorten and open. Same time this is occurring, there is a collection of amniotic fluid that's going to start to collect distally to the fetal presenting part, usually the baby's head. That's going to exert a pressure on the on the uh, against the wall of the amniotic sac and actually can uh, increase the the likelihood of the sac rupturing. The cervix is about when it's about halfway thinned and shortened we would say that the cervix is 50 percent effaced. While this effacement is occurring there is more amniotic fluid that is going to continue to um, collect and it's going to present some pressure on the cervix as well so it's going to also help with this process. So you can kind of see what I'm describing to you as the um, as the uterus is contracting and breathing the fetus downward the amniotic fluid is collecting distally to the fetal presenting part of the fetal head and <clears throat> um, it's going to um, create some pressure against the wall of the amniotic sac as well as help with the cervix to thin and open. 
So mom has to really get to 100% uh, effacement and she has to get to 10 centimeters dilated. So I'm showing you how this process progresses. With zero being no effacement, 50% being effaced means she's halfway thin and shortened. And then 100% would mean that the cervix is completely thinned, shortened, and then dilatation means opening. So if she's 10 centimeters dilated, she's at the point where she's going to progress and switch to another stage of labor. We'll get to the stages of labor later. I know this is kind of technical trying to understand, but this is essentially what you're seeing, what you're feeling is because this is a subjective assessment, what you're feeling. The amniotic sac has not ruptured in this patient. The, the cervix is thinning and shortening and opening. The presenting part is putting pressure um, against the, you know, the fluid that's collecting distally against the amniotic sac. And as these changes progress, mom's amniotic sac can rupture. As the cervix becomes shorter and thinner, it's drawn upward and the cervix is going to merge with the lower thinning segment of the uterus and it will really lose its cylinder shape. Um, a cervix that's been fully thinned and um, completely thinned and shortened is described as 100% effaced. So those are the two, the, the effacement changes. The second of the two things we have to talk about is dilatation. That's where the cervix is going to open. And we describe dilatation in terms of centimeters with 10 centimeters being fully dilated. <clears throat> 10 centimeters in dilatation is large enough for to um, allow the passage of your average size fetus. That's about the size of a bagel. And this action can be compared to a sock um, a ball being put off, pushed through the cuff of a sock. So the stages of dilatation, remember, is um, 0 to 10, with 10 being completely dilated. Now this is a subjective assessment, and it really, based on the clinician, um, sometimes when you're first beginning to learn, when you're first learning how to do this, you may not do it as well as someone who's been doing it for a significant period of time, but it's really looking at how far open the cervix is. And um, we do this on vaginal exam. You're going to um, put on sterile gloves and you're going to use some sterile um, lubrication and you're going to assess mom's cervix. You will feel her cervix. And as the... <clears throat> After the amniotic sac ruptures um, and the cervix dilates, you will start to feel the fetal head. So essentially, as the cervix is thinning and shortening and opening, the uterus is being pulled upward over the baby's head. And again, mom has to get to 10 centimeters in dilatation. And when I said the subjectivity, really, it depends on how far, you know, you can spread your fingers. And it's slightly different from clinician to clinician, but I'm just showing you how this process is done, how we evaluate this. Again, remember, there's different changes in the there's different um, differences, I should say, in the cervix of a nulliparous woman versus a multiparous woman. In a multiparous woman, her cervix is going to dilate much faster than a nulliparous woman. I don't spend a whole lot of time on Friedman's curve. I just like to mention it to tell you that if it's basically describing two variables. It's describing um, dilatation of the cervix and how the baby descends. And you can have a normal curve or an abnormal curve or a dysfunctional curve when the cervix stops dilating or the fetus stops descending. And that can be secondary to, you know, uh, CPD, like the baby's head is not fitting uh, through mom's bony pelvis or um, it may be due to uh, another reason, CPD is pretty uh, common, and that's what cephalopelvic disproportion stands for. That's the um, letters that you typically see associated with it. I'm going to talk about the status of her membranes and how we assess that. <clears throat> we will use either nitrazine, nitrazine paper or nitrazine swabs. And this is based on pH, and I know you learned pH in your previous message class, but if... Um, the, the vaginal environment is normally acidic and, out, and amniotic fluid is normally alkaline in nature. So if the amniotic, if the um, amniotic sac has ruptured and when they either using nitrazine paper or swabs uh, come in contact with amniotic fluid, the 
because of the change in pH and base, you'll have a change in the color of the paper. So um, because amniotic fluid is more alkaline, you will have you know a pH of 7.0, 7.5. That paper will turn more blue. But if it comes in contact with more vaginal secretions, because mom's amniotic sac is not ruptured, it will turn yellow or stay yellow because it's more acidic. We also consider pooling of amniotic fluid in the vaginal vault as a pretty positive sign that mom's um, her membranes have ruptured. It's important to know mom, the status of her membranes. We don't like her, her membranes to be ruptured greater than 18 to 24 hours because anything greater than that, the risk of infection increases significantly. So you will note um, most clinical agencies take note of how long mom's amniotic sac has been ruptured. Another way to determine if her amniotic sac has been ruptured, it, it, sometimes it may be inconclusive, inconclusive with the nitrazine paper or the nitrazine swabs. So they can do what's called fern tests, where they take some of the, they swab the, the vaginal secretions and they'll put it on a microscope right on the a labor and delivery ward. And they're, what they're looking for um, is this kind of firm leaf-like pattern. And this is what, it's not a leaf that you're looking at on the microscope. What you're looking at is amniotic fluid. Um, amniotic fluid on a slide will take a, a fern leaf appearance. So if they see this, they will be pretty confident that mom's amniotic sac has ruptured. <clears throat> Let's talk about the cardiovascular system changes that happen as labor progresses. During each uterine contraction, blood flow to the placenta gradually decreases, and this can cause an increase in mom's blood pressure and slow her, her pulse. If you if we have to assess her vital signs, we like to try to, if possible, assess her vital signs in between um, contractions, in that resting period between contractions, so we can get a true assessment of where her blood pressure is and where her pulse is same time during the course of labor and this is some overlapping because you learn this content in the antepartum period of time in the antepartum portion of your content and when you looked at your antepartum uh, content one of the things that you learned previous and it carries over into labor and delivery is we don't like to put the pregnant woman flat on her back because of the risk of supine hypotension you really want to encourage her to rest in positions other than flat on her back she she can um be on all fours, she can be sidelining, side laying, she can be standing, she can be squatting, but we really want her not to be flat on her back. Even if she has to have like a C-section procedure, they will probably wedge one of her hips, like put a pillow under one of her hips to kind of release some of the pressure off of, um, off of the major vessels that um, the weight of the, gra the gravid uh, uterus can compress. So we, tr we try to encourage her to be in other positions besides in the supine position. Let's talk about the respiratory system. The, the depth and rate of respirations can increase, especially if your patient is anxious or in pain. And the patient may not be completely aware that they're breathing more rapidly or um, more shallow. Deep breathing um, is what you really want to encourage. We want the patient to be aware of her breathing and to slow down her breathing. But during the course of labor and delivery, what you might see is the patient starts to hyperventilate. And some of the symptoms that you'll see of this is she'll have tingling in her hands and her feet, numbness. She might be dizzy. And most textbooks tell you to have the patient um, breathe in a paper bag, although most patients don't bring that with them to the hospital. Breathing in a cupped hand or like an emesis bag will allow mom to rebreathe some of the CO2 and help relieve some of those symptoms because what's happening is she's breathing off, she's blowing off too much CO2 and she needs to um, retain a little bit more of the CO2. And looking at the GI system, during the course of labor and delivery, gastric motility is reduced. Usually, especially when mom gets into to, um, you know, when labor really is, is moving, she may not be that hungry. Um, 
we usually have patients that will complain of feeling thirsty and a dry mouth and so we can help relieve that with like ice chips popsicles hard candy but when she gets further into labor they're going to usually withhold large volumes of food or fluid because of the risk of vomiting and aspiration and she may become a surgical patient she may become a c-section patient so um, what you'll see is they usually don't let them have large volumes of food typically they limit it to popsicles hard candy and ice chips um, in looking at the urinary system, a full bladder can decrease um, fetal descent. And sometimes mom may be unaware that her bladder is full. If she's had like an epidural, she may not even feel that she has a need to go to the bathroom. But a full bladder will inhibit fetal descent because it takes up space in the, in the pelvis. And so you have to frequently ass assess the stat the um, status of her bladder so um, you want to like do, are we going to do a bladder scanner um, are we you know we're gonna straight catheter periodically to make sure that we we make sure that the bladder is empty <clears throat> we talked about hemodilution in the postpartum uh, content so I'm not going to re you know reteach that uh, but it does it, it you it's Still, mom is still in the state of having extra plasma in her intravascular compartment. Um, when you look at the blood loss, the normal blood loss for a vaginal delivery is 500 mL, and the normal blood loss for a C section is um, 1,000 mL. We talked about that in postpartum, but it carries to this point as well because this is where. Um, where the procedure of a c-section or labor and delivery would occur um, mom still has the increased risk of of um, having or developing a dbt because her fibrogen level is increased and that's a key ingredient in the making of a clot so um, we want to make sure that she we know that we do even though she's in the process of labor we want her to move around as much as possible we want her to be comfortable we don't want her just in one position all the time and we may be if she has an epidural we may be assisting her with moving um, we talked about the fetal responses primarily in looking at the fetal heart rate patterns but I just want to help you remember that the mom's going to respond her body systems are going to respond and adapt to the normal labor process and so is the baby so um, there are some changes that are occurring we remember we talked about the decrease the, um, the during contractions of the blood flow to and from the fetus is temporarily decreased but most babies healthy babies babies without problems have protective mechanisms and are able to tolerate those short interruptions um, in blood flow they have a higher um, hemoglobin hematocrit uh, rate and they have a higher cardiac output so that is a protective mechanism they usually have enough reserve to tolerate those short interruptions in blood flow um, but if the baby is not that I mean, you sometimes see that with maternal conditions such as diabetes hypertension and some other complications then the baby may be it may need to be delivered in another way such as a c-section the baby's cardiovascular system reacts very quickly to the events that are occurring during labor the baby's heart rate is, is um, it ranges between 110 and 160 120s 140s 160 is good anything over 160 especially if it's sustained you want to think about tachycardia um, it is important to note that preterm babies if this is a preterm labor they may have a slightly higher heart rate than the term fetus when you look at the fetal pulmonary system when we talked about this in a normal newborn but now you're you're having where some information that was taught before might start to make sense a little bit in a different way um, before birth remember the newborn the uh, fetus their lungs are filled with fluid this really allows their lungs to develop but um, as mom goes into labor the the baby's body will respond by decreasing the production of this fluid as well as their lungs start to absorb this fluid that's in their lungs in the interstitial tissues of the lungs and as labor um, continues as the process of labor um, continues this process of reabsorption of this fluid 
will increase the absorption of this fluid. About a third of the fluid is expelled as the baby's head and chest are compressed through the birth canal and the remaining fluid that's left will be absorbed in the interstitial tissue as interstitial tissues of the lungs. Let's talk about the components of birth now. And labor is the process by which the uterus will expel its contents, including the fetus, the umbilical cord, the amniotic sac, and the placenta. If labor occurs prior to the 20th week, it is a threatened spontaneous abortion. It happens between the, the 20th and the 37th week, then it's considered by textbook a preterm labor, although a 37-weeker is in many in many ways fine in the normal newborn nursery, but it's by textbook definition. Maybe that's 38 to really 42 weeks of gestation considered term, and anything greater than 42 weeks is considered post-term labor. We know that the well-being of the infant correlates to gestational age. Remember, we talked about this in the normal newborn. Healthiest babies deliver at term. Labor and delivery nurse is really concerned with ensuring that both the mother and the fetus remain in the optimal condition throughout the labor and delivery process. We're going to talk about the critical P's now. There are five of them. For labor to progress, to have a vaginal delivery, you have to have a complementary relationship between these five critical P's, including the pelvis, which is the passageway, the fetus, which is the passenger, Mom, uh, the powers which are mom's uterine contractions and her pushing abilities when she gets to 10 centimeters, the psyche which is the mental status of the woman, and position of the woman. There are additional factors that influence the process. They are P's but they're not the five critical P's. They include the philosophy, the partners, the patients, pa patient preparation, and pain control. Let me just see how you're understanding this information. Factors that may extend or influence the duration of labor is, and there's two of them. Sorry, there's two of them. So it, it should be the, remember your critical P's, the position, and the passenger. Let's talk about the powers. The, po the two powers of labor are the uterine contractions, and the maternal pushing efforts. Um, the uterine contractions force the fetus through the maternal pelvis. Mom gets to 10 centimeters in dilatation. She's going to augment the uterine contractions by adding her voluntary efforts to propel the fetus through the, through the pelvis. Let's talk about the passage. The passage for, the, for birth of the fetus consists of the maternal pelvis and the soft tissues. The bony pelvis is usually more important to the outcome of labor than the soft tissues. There are different types of soft pelvises, and researchers in 1933 um, indicated this. Caldwell Malloy uh, were the first to say, listen, not all women have the same shape of pelvises. There are four types. You have the gynecoid pelvis, which is um, uh, more round. About 50% of the female population has this shape of pelvis. It's round and adequate in all diameters for birth. You have the android pelvis, which is not as common, about 20% of the population. Um, this is more of a heart-shaped uh, pelvis. Uh, it's more rare than the gynecoid-shaped pelvis. Um, and typically women who have this shape of pelvis end up with a c-section they are not usually able to they're not usually able to deliver vaginally and then you have the anthropoid shaped pelvis it's where you have longer a, um, anterior and posterior diameters um, they typically can they can usually uh, deliver vaginally but sometimes it will force the baby into an op position we'll get into what that means a little bit later and then you have the platypoid shaped pelvis which is not very common at all but it's more rare but it is in some it's found in some cases it's more of a flat pelvis and in this uh, shaped pelvis <clears throat> um, because of the the narrowed flat nature it's really inadequate for vaginal delivery this is a better picture for you to see the gynecoid, anthropoid, android, and platypoid shaped pelvis um, and what it means. And I have a better picture here for you so that you can see it's really looking at this narrow bony pelvic opening. 
when you compare, and just so you can understand, the gynecoid uh, pelvis compared to the android uh, uh, pelvis, the, the gynecoid sh uh, shaped pelvis is more wide and broad. You have less uh, prominent ischial spines, they're less pointy, and so you have a more round, uh, larger opening of a pelvis where when you look at the android uh, sh uh, shaped pelvis, it's more heart shaped, it's, they have a more uh, narrow suprapubic arch. The ischial spines are more prominent and it's a, m a much more narrowed opening. Um, and this is a, a, a just a different picture for you to see that. When you look at the bony pelvis, it's divided uh, by the lineal terminalis, which is the pelvic brim, into the false pelvis, uh, um, and then the true pelvis. The, the, the pelvic brim is where you start to enter into the true pelvis. The true pelvis is more important, or it's the most important, I should say, uh, portion of the passageway. Um, that, that narrow bony opening is more important than the false pelvis, which most people associate with thinking about um, childbearing. The true pelvis has three subdivisions. You have the inlet, or the upper pelvic opening. You have the mid pelvis, or the um, which is measured at the level of the ischial spines, and then the outlet, which is the lower pelvic opening. And when you're looking at the true pelvis, it's more of a curved cylinder shape and <clears throat> than um, one straight opening. So the true pelvis is what's crucially important, and it has to be adequate in size and shape for vaginal delivery to occur. The false pelvis has nothing to do with um, the delivery of a, a baby. It really just holds up the abdominal con contents. But again, there's three planes or measurements that we look at when we're looking at the passageway, and that's the inlet, um, the mid pelvis, and the outlet. So when you look at the inlet where we're entering into the true pelvis, um, that is, that is, if you remember from the previous slide, it starts at the lineal terminalis where you're coming into the true pelvis. What the area up above, which is the false pelvis, is not crucially important. Then you have the mid pelvis, which is measured at the level of the ischial spines, and then you have the, um, the outlet where the baby has to come out of, right? Um, so these are your three, your three planes. When you look at the inlet, they're going to, um, measure the um, obstetrical conjugate, which is it's about 9.5 centimeters, is usually considered adequate. Um, but this whole process of determining these measurements is called clinical pulmivitry. So what they're going to do is try to reach the diagonal conjugate. Most clinicians know the measurement of their own hands and they know that if we have about 11.5 centimeters, that is adequate in most diameters for vaginal birth. So what they're trying to do is to reach the back of the sacrum, the sacral promontory, and then they will estimate based on the measurements of their own hands uh, what this distance is. When you're looking at the obst the obstetric, um, obstetric excuse me, conjugate, um, it's it's the area which the baby's head must pass, and it's really indirectly known by the clinical assessment. It's it's an approximation that they're going to make. <clears throat> but if they're really concerned, they can, using other radiological measurements, more accurately assess this um, through a radio, you know, looking at. Um, an MRI or some other diagnostic test to, if they're really concerned that the, a woman has a contracted pelvis and are worried about um, whether this baby is going to be born vaginally, then they're going to do additional testing to determine this. Um, and then the mid pelvis is measured again at the level of the ischial spines. Um, it's important because this is the point of uh, engagement of the fetal head. And um, and then they can also, we'll get into what the biparietal diameter, but that's a measurement of the fetal head. If we need to know that, that's another uh, assessment that can be done. Um, but let's talk about the baby coming out of the pelvis now, which is the pelvic outlet. And this is measured at the level of the ischial tuberosities. A distance of eight centimeters or more is considered normal 
it's wider than the closed fist basically they'll estimate the shape of the, pel the pelvic arch and how they do this is when the clinician is doing a pelvic exam they will hold their fist up to the perineum and estimate this they know the measurement of their own fist and remember eight centimeters or larger is considered adequate and so if they estimate those measurements that they will then document that they feel um, that uh, the pelvic outlet is adequate I know this sounds uh, very technical, but what they're trying to do is to estimate um, the largest part of the fetal head, the largest part of the baby's body, which is the fetal head, how it's going to navigate this very narrow, bony pelvic opening. Um, and the pictures I was showing you is flat, but this is done, they're estimating this based on very specific measurements if this baby's head is going to be able to fit and navigate this very uh, narrow pelvic opening. Let's next talk about the passenger and um, the passenger is the fetus plus the membranes and the placenta. 96% of the time the fetus enters the birth canal in the cephalic or head down position. Less to a lesser extent the baby enters into the pelvis um, in the breech presentation which is the buttocks down and then even more uncommon is where the baby enters into the pelvis um, with the shoulder being the presenting part when you look at the bone sutures and fontanelles of the baby's head they are very important because the, the bones in the baby's head should not be fused they're connected by sutures and that allows the bones in the baby's head to adapt and change to the shape of mom's pelvis remember from the normal newborn content we call this molding the longer the baby's head is down in mom's bony pelvis the baby's head will adapt move and change to the shape the, the size and shape of mom's pelvis and become very molded as we said before in the normal newborn content that um, after delivery you give the baby 25 24 hours or greater like a couple days and the, the bones and their height the bones in the baby's head will move back to the normal shape um, but initially speaking the baby's head can mold to mom's pelvis and that's actually a good thing because that's the largest part of the baby's body if they are concerned though about the baby's head and measurements and the patient might have a contracted pelvis they can actually do a measurement either by ultrasound or radiographical study radiological study I should say um, and assess the biparietal diameters of the baby's head however again most fetuses will enter into the pelvis in the cephalic presentation and that's actually good there's now different variations to the, the cephalic presentation but why we prefer this is because it it allows for flexion and flexion is important in fetal descent next thing I want to talk to you about is station and that is how far down the baby is uh, descending into mom's pelvis and this is measured by the relationship of the fetal head to the to the ischial spine and this is measured in negative and positive numbers and it's basically looking at centimeters the ischial spine is deep deep in mom's pelvis is considered midway into the tri true pelvis it's like kind of a halfway point in the true pelvis and if the presenting part is higher than the ischial spines the station will have a negative number once you the fetal presenting part reaches the level of the ischial spines that station which is describing fetal descent is what we're talking about is considered zero station and then as the baby drops below the level of the ischial spines it'll have a positive number when you get to the number positive four that means that the baby is, is at the level of the um, the pelvic outlet so kind of this is how you're seeing this so and remember the baby is going to make this these this descent in small incremental stages so a baby that's about um, one centimeter above the level of the ischial spines would be a negative one station and one centimeter one centimeter is approximately one finger breath so just a question to see if you could um, understand this content what is this station
What is this station? If the presenting part is higher than the initial spine, the station has what type of number? Hopefully, you have said if it's higher than the initial spines, it's a negative number. If it's lower than the initial spines, it's a positive number. So when we describe that, what we're talking about when we're looking at station is fetal descent. So, and it's describing this in comparison to the ischial spines, which is what we're measuring fetal descent against. So zero station means the top of the, the baby's head or the presenting part is at, is at the level of the ischial spines and that baby's considered fully engaged in mom's pelvis. Plus two station means the baby is approximately two centimeters, the presenting part is approximately two centimeters past or below the level of the ischial spines. Now let's talk about variations in the passenger. We're going to talk about fetal lie, fetal attitude, and fetal presentation. Fetal lie is really looking at the orientation of the long axis of the fetus and comparing that, to, uh, excuse me, the long axis of the fetus and comparing it to the long axis of the woman. Longitudinal lie means that the, the fetal spine and the maternal spine are parallel, they're going in the same direction. Where a transverse lie means that the long axis of the fetus is at the right angle of the woman. It's long axis. Basically, it's saying that the fetus, the, the spine is laying, the baby's spine is laying across mom's spine. Well, then we're going to talk about fetal attitude, and that is the relationship of body parts to each other. Um, and normally the fetal attitude of the fetus is one of flexion with the baby's head flexed towards the chest and the arms and legs flexed over the thorax. Um, you can have an attitude of extension, which we don't like, it's abnormal. We see this in face presentation where the back of the baby's head is extending towards the baby's spine. We can um, outline or palpate the, the, the pregnant um, uterus to kind of figure out the position of the fetus. This is called Leopold's Maneuver and you can actually go to YouTube if you want to go to YouTube and you can watch them actually do this one on the patient but they're palpating um, the the um, pregnant patient's abdomen to determine the position of the fetus. We talk about presentation. The baby enters into the pelvis um, in three categories. You have the cephalic presentation, the breech presentation, and the, so the shoulder presentation. So the term presentation means the part of the fetus that is um, presenting first. Position is determined in relationship to the landmark on the fetus presenting part to the four quadrants of the maternal pelvis. So how you look at this, it's a lot of times written in a three-letter acronym or two-letter acronym. You're going to look at a mom's pelvis. So we're going to look at the right, the right side of mom's pelvis or the left side of mom's pelvis. We're going to talk about um, mom's, the, the anterior portion of her pelvis or the posterior portion of her pelvis. We're talking about mom's right or left. So if the baby is neither, the presenting part is neither in the or I should say the, the fetal reference point is neither right or left in the portion of the right or left of mom's pelvis, then it's not considered right or left. We'll abbreviate or omit that letter ROL. The second letter refers to the fixed fetal presenting part. Um, and you have occipit, mentum, or sacrum. So those are your three choices. The chin or the mentum is the reference point in the face presentation. The sacrum is the reference point in the breech presentation. Then the third letter uh, describes whether the fetus is in the anterior posterior portion of mom's pelvis. If the baby is not in the anterior or transverse but is in the middle, it is anterior or posterior, it's in the middle, it is referred to as transverse. So here is an example of these. ROA means the baby is in the right portion of mom's pelvis, the occipit portion of the baby is the presenting part and the baby is laying in the anterior portion of mom's pelvis. So um, just kind of gives you an example of how you can look at these letters to, to describe, excuse me, these um, descriptions of the, the fetal presenting 
positions. So another one would be like ROT, meaning the baby is in the right portion of mom's pelvis. The occiput, which is the back of the baby's head, is the presenting part. The baby is in the transverse position, which means the baby is neither anterior or posterior, but it's in the center. So you can see in these pictures uh, different uh, fetal uh, presentations in the different positions that they can be in. Also, when we talk about anterior, the baby is facing mom's spine. Posterior is typically the baby's facing uh, mom's belly button. And a, a little, this is just a little thing that I sometimes give students to help them understand. When you're looking at um, a baby that's um, in that's considered posterior, it means the back of the baby's head is directed towards the back of mom's pelvis, so the baby is looking at mom's belly button. This is an example, so you can see what this looks like when we're talking about fetal presentation. You see the different way that the baby is laying in mom's pelvis. So um, if the baby is in the left anterior quadrant of mom's pelvis, baby is described as left occiput anterior anterior, excuse me, I need some water here, left occipit anterior, which is LOA, and that's the most common position for uh, babies to be in. Um, I'm just showing you the different uh, positions that the baby can be in um, in utero, so you can see the different uh, positions that um, may be come into play when you're looking at fetal positions. You also can use this sometimes when you're looking at assessing the baby's heart rate um, and where we can locate the baby's heart rate. So the cephalic presentation is the most favorable. The head is the largest part of the baby's body, which is good. We want the largest part to be born first. The baby's head is smooth, round, and hard, and it's really good at helping dilate the cervix. There's four variations of cephalic presentation. Um, including the vertex, which means that the baby's head is fully flexed. Um, military, the baby's head is neutral. It's not flexed or extended. Or you have brow presentation where the baby's head is partially extending back. Face presentation means the baby's um, head is fully extended where the, the back of the baby's head is near um, the fetal spine. This is examples of types of, of cephalic presentations. So I'm showing you brow presentation and, and face presentation. So you're starting to see um, partial extension and then full extension, which is not desirable because you want the, the fetus to be in a flexed position. It helps the baby navigate uh, mom's bony pelvis in those very narrowed openings. Next, we want to talk about breech presentation. Breech presentation occurs when the fetal buttocks or the feet enter the pelvis first. There are several disadvantages to breech presentation. Um, the first thing, the buttocks are not smooth and they're not hard, so they're less effective in helping dilatation. Second, the baby's head is the last part of the baby's body to be born. Um, the baby has umbilical cord compression, um, which I shouldn't say the baby has umbilical cord compression. I should say with breech presentation, there is a risk for umbilical cord compression because it takes a little bit of time for manipulation for a breech delivery and the baby's umbilical cord can become trapped between mom's body and the baby's body and the baby isn't completely out. Um, and then remember when the baby is in the head down position, gradual molding occurs. So the baby's head molds and adapts to mom's pelvis. Well, babies in the breech presentation, gradual molding doesn't occur. Here are different variations to breech presentation. We'll talk about these more in high risk, but you have full breech. You can have single foot length breech or double foot length breech. You can have frank uh, or frank breech. And then you have shoulder presentation, and this position really requires C-section. This baby is not going to be able to be born vaginally. It's also known as transverse lie. The baby's lying across mom's pelvis. We can determine fetal position on vaginal exam, and that's where you locate 
the log, the sagittal uh, suture on the baby's head and you sweep your fingers in a circular motion anterior to posterior to outline where the baby's head is. It's basically using the baby's fontanelles as landmarks to determine uh, the fetal position. And I'm just showing you how this is done. This is the last critical P. Now I told you we would talk about this as this information progresses and um, uh, we are we're here at it now. This is a, an important part of childbirth and that's the patient's ability to stay calm and in control. Keep in mind anxiety or fear can decrease a patient's ability to cope with pain especially in labor and as a part of that what can happen is mom's body can go into fight or flight if she becomes very very anxious or fearful and loses the ability to stay in control and as part of that fight or flight response her body can release stress hormones um, also known as maternal catecholamines in response to anxiety or fear and that can influence uterine contractility and placental blood flow it actually can reduce and inhibit uterine contractility and reduce a blood flow to the placenta so the best of our ability we want mom to try to stay relaxed and in control um, and sometimes some patients may need some medication support to do so not all I mean, some patients can um, they have a high tolerance for pain and they can um, through practice and pre preparation can prepare for natural childbirth and they are able to stay relaxed and in control um, but other patients may need some medication or they may need an epidural to help them stay in control I want to talk to you about the this changes of, of pain that happen and what causes pain through the different stages of labor. I'm going to explain the stages of labor later but I want to talk about a pain first. So I want you to know that pain is real and there are different causes of pain and labor as mom progresses through the stages of labor. In stage one what can be perceived as painful to her can be due to the stretching of the cervix during dilatation and effacement also as the uterus is contracting there's decreased blood flow uh, to the uterus so um, uterine ischemia um, or anoxia the decreased blood flow can also cause uh, pain and then the stretching of the uterine ligaments can cause pain in stage two this is the pushing stage which we'll get to um, in addition to the previous content that we just went over you're going to add some new um, um, factors that can also cause her pain in addition to the ones we just reviewed and that is distension of the vagina and the perineum by the fetus um, compression of the nerve ganglia and the cervix in the lower uterus also pressure that is placed on mom's urethra on her bladder and our, on her rectum during fetal descent and then traction and stretching of the perineum can also cause pain during the second stage what you want to remember is that these emotion the emotional response is real if she's experiencing fear anxiety helplessness exhaustion those can add to psychological stress and so to help her stay in more control you want to provide physical and emotional support um, comfort measures and pain management we look at these five P's they really have a complementary relationship for example a woman with a small pelvis but a normally shaped pelvis can have a large baby if it with normal labor if the fetus is positioned correctly just an example of how this can be a complementary relationship you don't also you don't want to discount culture in the labor and delivery process I've talked to you guys about culture throughout this content um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it but I will say this that a family's culture really can affect the the views of birth and the practices that surround it and a woman's culture gives her cues as how she should behave and react in labor for example in some cultural responses to pain some patients don't make any sound that doesn't mean that they don't want pain medicine it's just in their culture you don't you don't verbally express pain so she may be waiting for you to assess to see if she needs something for pain but in your mind you're like well she's really tolerating labor well um, I'm not going to offer payments because she's doing such a good job. Um, so you just want to remember um, to that cultural influences can um, play a role as to how a patient reacts in labor. 
This is just an example of what I mean about cultural influences. So in our culture, like this is an example, they took into the labor and delivery room. It's a little girl, it's a little boy t-shirt. And depending on what baby was born, they brought that t-shirt out and show grandma that is a cultural influence that's culturally relevant um because that's kind of what we do here but in other cultures they may have other practices for example who holds the baby who kisses the baby who gives the baby its first bath or who blesses the baby or who's with mom during the labor and delivery process all all culturally relevant um, this is a picture from papua new guinea friends that were uh, was a midwife in Papua New Guinea but um, it's just in that cultural practice um, it, it's women of the woman's family um, that are with her and they may be unclothed so that not to cause her shame so again culturally relevant practice in some cultures, they may tie an amulet around mom or the baby after delivery. Um, it's a culturally relevant practice. Or they may dress mom and baby in a certain attire. They're all culturally relevant practices. The labor and delivery nurse should assess the individual family of the laboring patient so that we don't discount culture. And I talked to you guys about this before. Like for example, a, a squat bar versus a birthing belt. That's a culturally relevant practice. Let's go into normal labor. The factors that initiate labor, we know some things. Like I talked to you about the theories that we are, um, that we think about or think influence labor, but there's some things that we don't know and that we're still learning because of research. What we do know is labor begins when the forces to continue the pregnancy are overcome. And there are several things that have a role. I've already talked to you about the fetal uh, steroidal theory or the changes in maternal estrogen to progesterone or the, um, the stretching and pressure and irritation on the uterus and the cervix. We've talked about those. Those are some factors. There are some warning signs that labor is soon to begin. It, doesn't, it hasn't happened yet. She's not in true labor, but it's, this process is soon to start. One mom may notice an increase in her Braxton Hicks contractions. Um, they may become more frequent and start to become more uncomfortable. Um, she might notice that the baby drops. This is called lightning, where the baby drops lower into the, the pelvic segment. Um, she might know an increase in her vaginal discharge or secretions and there's a difference between bloody sh we use these terms interchangeably too to cause some confusion to students but they are used interchangeably um, it's not purposeful but um, like for example bloody show can be used to describe the mucus plug also right before right at the time of delivery when she's really close you'll notice an increase in the bloody mucusy um, discharge that's happening and that's not the mucus plug um, but they're both called bloody show um, and then you have nesting syndrome which is a sudden burst of energy anywhere from 24 to 48 hours prior to the onset of labor um, a small group of women may have weight loss but that's not everyone um, a small group of women have flu-like symptoms but you should be careful because we don't want to discount an infectious process some women what starts the process or the it's close to start is her amniotic sac ruptures this is what i mean this is the mucus plug that some women uh, pass and this is the increase in uh, bloody discharge that she may have when she's really close to delivering there are differences between true and false labor um, and they differ in three categories, including contractions, discomfort, and the cervix. When you look at um, false labor versus true labor, there's there's some some differences that should become apparent to you. In false labor, and I'm not saying false labor isn't uncomfortable to the patient, but the patient isn't in true labor yet. Those contractions that moms is experiencing they're inconsistent they're inconsistent in duration intensity and frequency and they don't typically change with activity um, such as walking if she's in true labor activities such as walking will stimulate contractions but if she's not in true labor you're not going to necessarily see a change with her activity in addition the contractions that she feels 
typically in false labor, they're more in the abdomen and they're more annoying to her than painful. And most importantly, that the contractions that she's experiencing in false labor are not causing any change to her cervix. So you're not seeing any dilatation or effacement that occur. When you compare that to true labor, you're going to see a consistent pattern. You're going to see pat a consistent pattern in frequency, duration, and intensity. Activities such as walking can stimulate contractions. And the discomfort that mom feels, they, it typically starts in the back and it will sweep around her uh, pelvic girdle. And they start to, as labor progresses, they're going to hurt more and become more and more uncomfortable to her um, and more painful to her. And the contractions that she's experiencing are bringing cervical changes such as effacement and dilatation. So in this slide, I'm just, we, it's the same information we just went over. I'm just trying to show you the, the differences, contraction, um, bloody show, cervix and fetal movement. Um, but most importantly, the contractions aren't bringing changes in her cervix. Talk about the mechanisms of labor, also known as the cardinal movements of labor. And the, basically, this is describing how the baby adapts to the size and shape of mom's pelvis at different levels. Baby is going to change uh, positions. And um, how the baby does this, it's how the baby makes these distinctive movements and navigates through mom's uh, bony pelvis. Um, so the baby's going to descend and the baby's going to become engaged. And um, it's where the baby, where the widest um, part of the fetal presenting part reaches the plane below the pelvic inlet. And so the baby's entering into the true pelvis. And if the baby's head uh, reaches the level of the ischial spines, the baby's considered engaged in deep in mom's pelvis. Baby's going to continue to descend. Now, baby starts descending. That's the first. But baby's going to continue to descend. And it's going to reach, it's going to go downward. This is not a steady, you know, one big movement. This is slow incremental movements. Um, and the baby's going to make over a period of time as it navigates the, the bony pelvis. And then the baby is going to reach some resistance of the maternal pelvic floor. And and the baby's head is going to flex because it reaches, reaches the resistance of the bony pelvic floor. And the baby's head will flex. And the baby's head is going to start to turn. It's called internal rotation, where um, you have rotation of the fetal head from the um, occipit transverse to either anterior or posterior position. It really depends on which way the baby is positioned, but the baby's head is going to have to turn in order for it to fit in a very narrow uh, space. And then the baby's head is going to extend underneath mom's uh, pubic bone. This is called extension. And then the baby's head is out. The baby's head is born. And now the baby's shoulders have to, to fit. So as the baby's head is delivered, it's going to rotate back to its original position and allow for inter, um, external rotation so that it can align anatomically with its torso. In other words, it has to turn so now that the baby's shoulders can fit through this narrow space. And this is called external rotation. In some textbooks, it's called restitution. And then the rest, the baby's body is going to be born by slow expulsion. So these are called the cardinal movements. Your textbook goes into greater descriptions about each of these incremental movements, but I'm just trying to explain that to you so that um, you understand uh, how the baby um, navigates the, the mom's bony pelvis. So you can actually see some of this occurring as you're watching a baby being born. Um, if you look specifically at uh, uh, letter B, the, where the baby's extending, the baby's extending under mom's pubic bone, and then the baby's head is out, and, and um, letter C on this top slide, and you can see how the baby's head turns. The baby's body is turning so that its shoulders can fit, and then you have delivery by 
by expulsion. And that's delivery of the baby's body in the, in the fetal body. When you look at the maternal responses to labor, labor is hard work and it's just going to take time. It's not, uh, for most patients, it's not a very rapid um, process. Although, I will say, if a woman's had a baby before, the time it took her to deliver her first baby for versus her second or third baby, um, the first baby usually takes a little bit longer. If a woman has a rapid birth, and we'll talk about that in high risk, that's different. But typically speaking, labor is hard work. There are changes in each of our body systems, which we just discussed. We're going to move now and look at the stages and the phases of labor. So each stage of labor, and some have sub-phases, has qualities that set it apart from others. Um, these descriptions are, are, are approximate, but they're very succinct to the description of how, uh, where and how a patient is in the labor process. This picture shows three, but really there's four. I did not have a picture that showed you specifically the four stages of labor. There are four stages of labor. So I'm going to give you an overall term for each stage. The first stage of labor, what I want you to kind of think of is this is the dilating stage. It's the longest stage. It's going to begin with mom entering into true labor and it's going to end with the cervix being completely dilated and faced 10 centimeters. <coughs> Excuse me. The first stage of labor has three subcomponents, including the latent phase, the active phase, and the transition phase. <coughs> And you can see slight variances and differences in the patient depending on if this is a first time mom or she's had multiple babies. So in the first stage of labor, mom is dilated from zero to three centimeters. Really what you want to see is less than four because some hospital institutions will say 3.5 centimeters. What you want to kind of in the back of your mind is say mom is less than four centimeters in dilatation so she is in the latent phase. Remember the first phase has subphases. So the, the first subphase is the latent and its mom is zero to three centimeters in dilatation. Effacement is occurring. Contractions are going to gradually increase until they're about five minutes apart and she's going to have a regular pattern in her contraction uh, cycles. Usually you can tell these patients because they're usually very excited. They're usually very ha happy. They're talkative. They can talk through their contractions. They may be apprehensive or nervous, but she can talk through her contractions. They, they, um, they're, they're uncomfortable, but they're not extremely painful yet, but she's going to progress. So again, just remember latent phase less than four contractions may, um, not be as painful yet she can talk through them um, she's going to dilate slowly she can be here for a couple hours now where i have here it says may last days or longer that really depends like uh, what i'm trying to say is if she's in an induction um, an induction can take a lot longer for her to progress through these stages um, than a patient who came in and act who excuse me who came in as a natural process and if this is her first baby this may take a lot longer than if this is her second baby or her third baby then mama's gonna move from the latent phase to the active phase where the cervix is gonna dilate from four to seven centimeters in dilatation, anything less than eight centimeters. Um, her contractions are going to increase intensity, frequency, and duration, right? Because we said labor, labor is going to progress, so her contractions are going to progress. Usually by this time, effacement is completed and the fetus is going to begin to descend into the pelvis. It's going to begin with the internal rotation. What I want you to take away from is in the active phase, mom's discomfort is going to increase and she'll start to become more internally focused. She, when you're, when she's um, experiencing a contraction, she may not be able to, um, she may not be able to talk through her contractions because they're so uncomfortable for her, but she's, she's going to really feel more uncomfortable. It's at this point in time that you and many times have a patient come in. It's usually during the latent or um, active
active phase of labor is where they're admitted. So I'm trying to give you what your nursing management is going to be at this particular time. So I've given you kind of the things that we're going to do for her at this point. It's more, most frequently is when you're going to see a patient be admitted to, um, in labor in the labor and delivery unit. So, um, the active phase of labor, I've given you the nursing management for that period of time between the latent and active phase, which I'm going to be doing with her. Um, she's at least four centimeters in, di in dilatation and she's less than eight, so it's between four and seven. Um, she's going to have reg regular, frequent, and increasingly more painful contractions. She is not comfortable laughing, talking uh, during her contractions, but she's you might see her starting to moan or to, you know, be very focused on her breathing during, during her contractions. And then she's going to progress and she's going to move from the active subphase of labor to the transition subphase of labor. We're still in the first, the first stage of labor. So the cervix is dilated from eight to 10 centimeters in dilatation. The fetus is descending further into the pelvis. Remember I said as mom is getting closer to delivery, you're going to see an increase in that bloody discharge. It's also called bloody show. You're going to see an increase in that. This is a very um, short, intense, painful phase. It's the most painful portion, but it's also the shortest phase. Uh, mom is going to have really strong contractions. Sometimes you'll hear your patient um, start to verbalize, like, I really feel like I have to go to the BF room, or they'll feel a lot of rectal or pelvic pressure. Um, some patients, they'll start with that. When we talked about this in postpartum, but they'll start with the leg tremors. And nauseousness and vomiting are very common in this phase, um, but she's very close to delivering. This can be confusing to her support person because she may be very irritable now. This is the patient who does not have an epidural or she's you know experiencing natural childbirth. Um, she may be very irritable. Um, the things that the support person or people were doing to provide support to her now may start to irritate her and it's confusing to them. So sometimes they may need your support too. Um, and even you as a nurse, some things that you were doing to help her cope, she may become very irritable with them um, at this point. Just so you can kind of have an overall picture of this, because we're this is the first stage. I just wanted you to understand in a short snap just how this progresses. So when you look at the con the characteristics of the contractions, latent, active, and transition phases, this is the first stage of labor. Um, I'm showing you how her contractions change and how the frequency, intensity, and duration increases. Now we, when mom reaches 10 centimeters of, of dilatation, we are no longer in the first stage of labor. We're now transitioning to the second stage of labor. It's going to begin with her being 10 centimeters in dilatation, and it's going to end with the birth of the baby. An overall theme I want you to take from this uh, particular um, content is that this is the pushing phase. Um, so it's going to begin with 10 centimeters in dilatation. She's 100% effaced. We're going to now start to have mom augment her the uterine contractions and add her pushing efforts. So as the fetus descends, there's going to be pressure um, presented on the rectum. She's going to feel a lot of, uh, of rectal pressure. And some patients have what's called involuntary pushing. They will actually start to push and, and they can't they can't stop that process. So um, typically they'll do a pelvic prep. We don't do like um, giving mom an enema or shaving them like they used to do. That was a long time ago. They would do that to moms. We don't. But you may see the OBGYN or the midwife uh, bathe mom's perineum with like a kind of a washing solution and prep for the de delivery. It's just kind of like a special soap and they, this is kind of the pattern that they use uh, to do so. While you're uh, prepping mom for the second stage of labor, you want to keep in mind mom may be complaining of um, 
this burning, tearing sensation, even when there is no perineal trauma. This is called the ring of fire, especially we'll note this during crowning when the baby's head is emerging, but it's the the muscles of the pelvic floor that are being stretched open. Um, and so she may complain of the sensation during this, this time. It's important to note that during the time of crowning that the baby's head is, the, the perineum is slowly stretched over the baby's head. We don't like that. You'll notice the midwife and the, um, the delivering OBGYN usually try to get mom to, instead of pushing really, really hard, to slow down and pant and slowly push, like they make little small pushes so they can decrease the risk of perineal trauma. During this time, again, this patient may have strong urges to push. She may say she feels like she's having to go to the bathroom, and sometimes you have to remind her that it's the baby that she's feeling. Now, I will say this, while this patient is delivering, the, the rectum can uh, become distended, and if she, you know, if she has stool in the rectum, she's pushing with the same muscles to push the baby out that she would to go to the bathroom. So she may um, unintentionally have a bowel movement. There's nothing really she can do about that. It's part of the process. It happens. We just clean her up and move on. Um, but as the fetal, as the fetus descends into the pelvis, you'll note that the vulva descends with the crowning of the fetal head. And that patient may say to you that she feels like she's tearing or she feels burning, um, and there may not be any perineal trauma. This is this is the time when the patient may need a lot of support. A lot of times they're really tired. The contractions are strong. She may be completely oblivious to her surroundings and completely internally focused. She may need a lot of help in changing positions. Um, but this is this stage is going to end with the birth of the baby. So you want to provide a lot of encouragement and support to your patient at this point in time. So this stage is going to end with the birth of the baby. So just so you can kind of have an idea of what you're seeing. So during this, this process, you see the anterior posterior slit. During contractions, remember I told you the, the uterine contractions are propelling the fetus downward. And actually during a contraction, you can see a portion of the vertex of the baby's head. In this next picture, you can see it. This is not mom pushing. That is the contraction. So you can actually see um, part of the baby's head. Um, that is being expressed because of the uterine contractions. But mom, during the second stage of labor, is going to augment the contractions with her pushing efforts. And so um, you'll see the the oval opening, the vertex of the baby's head, and the perineum begins to bulge. Um, they may put some pressure um, and support on the, the rectum. If she has a bowel movement, we're going to clean it up and, and continue. Clo crowning is a slow process where they're going to um, have the perineum slowly stretched over the infant's head to minimize trauma. When the baby's head is born, the delivering midwife or the OBGYN is going to check for a nuchal cord, and that's where the umbilical cord is wrapped tightly around the baby's head and then the baby is going to begin to rotate. Remember I said external rotation. Look at this baby's the position of this baby's head in this slide to this next side slide. The baby is going to to rotate so um, it can align its torso so the baby's shoulders can can fit. So the baby's head is supported through external rotation um, or restitution depending on the textbook that you uh, use. We don't, you don't see a whole lot of suctioning done of infants, but if we do need to do it, they're going to suction the baby's mouth first and then the baby's nose. And then the baby is going to be born uh, by expulsion. So now our second stage of labor is complete, and now we're going to go to the third stage of labor, which is the overall theme I want you to know for this stage is the placental stage. It's going to begin with the birth of the baby, and it's going to end with the expulsion of the placenta. Um, the placenta usually separates and is expelled from the uterus. It's facilitated by uterine contractions, so mom is still going to feel contractions. This is the shortest stage. It can range anywhere from five, on average, just five to ten minutes, but some patients it may take a slight 
a slightly additional period of time. It usually is less than 20 minutes. Um, but there's four symptoms that this is occurring. The uterus is going to change shape. It's going to become more spherical and globular. And it's going to rise up in the abdomen as the placenta drops into the vagina. And this action um, pushes the fundus upward. And the, the fundus, the top of the uterus, is going to become firm. Same time, <coughs> you're going to excuse me, you're going to see a gush of blood. Now, the remember, the placenta is tearing away from the uterine wall, so the blood that is released when that occurs, it, that's trapped, is now going to be released, and the umbilical cord is going to look like it's getting longer, but actually it's because the, the um, placenta, which is normally implanted up by the fundus, is dropping down in the vaginal vault, um, and so you'll see a change in position of the, the umbilical cord. And so there's three, um, excuse me, there's two mechanisms of placenta uh, expulsion. We're still under the third stage of labor. And that's either by shiny, shiny Schultz or Dirty Duncan. So Schultz is the most common mechanism. That's how the placenta is delivered. And it's delivered with the, the shiny, smooth fetal side. Um, and then the rough, bloody um side maternal side that was attached to the, the uterine wall is by Duncan method of delivery so I'm showing you a is the Schultz method of delivery and B is the Duncan method of delivery so basically what we just said the plus we talked about the um, change in the uterine um, appearance how it becomes more spherical um, and then the the placenta is going to drop because it's going to detach from the uterine wall and it's up by the fundus and it's going to drop and it's going to make the umbilical cord look like it's lengthening and it's going to descend either by Schultz or Duncan uh, method of delivery and then it's expelled and once it's, it is expelled the, the midwife or the delivering physician very rapidly, it's usually just a really quick assessment. If you blink, you'll miss it. But they're going to quickly look at the placenta and make sure it looks like it's all there, looks, make sure it doesn't look like it's fragmented. They may uh, assess the patient to see if there's any retained fragments. They're going to... Um, see if you know if the uterus is firming up because they need it to so we can assess for her bleeding and we're going to enter the fourth stage and the fourth stage is a time of recovery um, we're going to recover both mom and the baby keep in mind mom may be hungry and thirsty at this point she's still she at this time is at risk for uterine acne and hemorrhage so they're going to keep close tabs on her her uterus and make sure that her uh, fundus is firm and um, that she doesn't have you know a lot of she doesn't have excessive bleeding they're going to assess for that and at the same time we're going to promote bonding with this baby and attachments we're going to do skin to skin care <coughs> this is um, a picture of the the amniotic sac with the placenta attached so you can kind of see where the baby was in the um, amniotic sac. I talk to, I usually talk to students about this in class, um, but this is a baby that is born in a call, and I'm showing you, this is where the amniotic sac hasn't ruptured, and I'm showing you this picture for two reasons. One, to show you a call, but second, you can really see what normal amniotic fluid looks like. It's normally pale, yellowish, yellowish clear. Sometimes it may have flecks of um, vernix in it or skin cells but that's what normal amniotic fluid looks like this is a baby born in a call and we this is normally babies don't have this shrink wrapped appearance to them we'll talk about that more in high risk but this is a baby born inside its amniotic sac and basically what we're going to do is we're going to rupture this sac open and continue to recover the baby uh, or to, you know as if the baby delivered outside of the call we're just going to rupture it and, and move on so again, we're in the fourth stage of, of the, the uh, labor and delivery process. This is a stage of recovery for both mom and baby. Typically, most textbooks describe this in the first one to four hours after birth. Usually after birth, remember, we're going to very quickly after birth assess her fundus, and it should be firm and contracted and, and palpable. The... Bloody drainage that a patient has after delivery, we talked about in the postpartum content, but it's called lochia. Um, 
sometimes patients, and we talk about this in uh, postpartum too, but it, there's some overlapping here. So um, some patients right after delivery can, for about 15 to 20 minutes, have like it's called a postpartum chill, but it's where they're having some uh, vasomotor response to um to the change in hormones and so you might see them shaking like they're cold and they're not you just cover them with warm blankets give them about 20 minutes and that will go away um, we're going to address in this period of time you know if she had a, a perineal laceration she may need to have it repaired if she had an episiotomy they're going to repair it um, she may have some some afterbirth cramping they may give her some medication for that um, but she's usually excited but also tired and hungry the whole duration of labor differs from a patient who's had a baby before versus one who has not so again your multiparous women progress a lot more rapidly through this process if your patient has a history of rapid precipitous deliveries and we talked about precipitous deliveries before but that term mean that term means mom delivers very rapidly within um, less than two to three hours or less she delivered and that if she has that history typically she um, will repeat that pattern in her subsequent birth. I already talked to you about the labor curve. I'm not going to do that again. I want to talk to you about the nursing care of the labor and delivery patient. Um, we're going to talk to her. This is typically what we teach patients about the labor and delivery process. Um, and it's part of the education that is given to them, but you're going to talk to them about, and this is presented a lot of times in their childbirth education classes, um, about when to go to the hospital. If she's a nulliparous woman, um, five minutes apart for the first, if she's having contractions, five minutes apart for the first hour. If she's a multiparous woman, ten minutes apart for the first hour. And irrespective, if she's multiparous or not, we want to see her, even if she's not contracting, we want to see her for these reasons. If she feels like her uh, membranes have ruptured, if she feels like she's experiencing bright red uh, bleeding, or she feels like she doesn't feel the baby moving as much or not at all, we want to see her. We don't need uh, her to wait. She needs to come safely, but um, uh, quickly to the hospital. During um, the labor and delivery process, you want to... Um, during the admission process, establish a therapeutic relationship with them, establish their expectations. Many families develop a birth plan, so you want to find out what that birth plan is. You want to try to uh, to convey confidence and um, try to help, because a lot of times they're anxious, so we want to put those feelings of anxiety aside. You want to make them feel welcome and keep in mind that their first impression can influence how they feel about the quality of their birth experience. Again, a lot of times they've studied their options for birth plans and we try to, the best of our ability, to incorporate those wishes into their plans, into our, our care, what their plans are. <clears throat> you, again, want to try to convey confidence. Um, you, she's nervous and she may be anxious and she may be uncomfortable because of the contractions and in some instances depending on how far they are in the labor process she may feel overwhelmed by the pain so we want to be supportive to her they're going to assign a primary nurse I tell students to and new nurses to take your cues for touch for touch from your patient some patients want you to touch them as part of a supportive um, therapeutic environment others do not so you kind of take your your cues from them remember your cultural values and always be prepared for impending delivery <clears throat> at the time of admission you know if she's if she's not far along in the process we're going to do the nursing interventions that i showed you um, between the um the latent and the active phase of labor because that's when they a lot of times they come in um, but if she comes in and she's ready to deliver um, we may have to delay that if you're going to delay some of that you need to um, assess the you know the fetal heart rate assess the cervical status like is she dilated where is she so you know how to progress and some of the symptoms that you might see that tell you that mom is coming in ready to deliver um, they come in grunting bearing down sitting on one side like sitting on one buttock um, and when you 
you assess her perineum, you might notice that the, the vulva is bulging. Um, she's delivering. So um, we are always prepared for impending birth. And we usually have rooms set up to go because patients can come in um, with birth being imminent. If birth is not imminent, you're going to um, contact either the, the OBGYN or call or the midwife. Um, you're going to get some basic information from her, which I kind of showed you in that the, those slides um, in the um, nursing care in between the um, latent and active phase. Um, but, so we're going to determine, you know, like her contraction pattern the status of her membranes, etc., and progress process her admission. When you do the um, admission process, you're again are going to notify either the attending, like the OBGYN or the midwife. Um, there are going to be some consent forms that they're going to have her sign in the labor and delivery process early on, such as she wants a circumcision. Um, you're going to probably have to get some blood for some blood work like an H and H <clears throat> so you're going to uh, start a large bore angiocath a lot of times you grab your labs at the same time you probably will uh, be asked to collect some urine as well um, it's usually a clean catch and then you um, you will if the mom consents and the physician feels that she should have some fluids, you're typically good because she's going to be MPO. You're typically going to give her an electrolyte containing fluid such as LR. We don't tip, we don't do the perineal props or enemas like they used to do a long time ago. Um, but sometimes people still think we do, but we don't. So I want you to know we don't do that. <clears throat> So they're going to assess the fetal heart rate. Where is the baby's heart rate? If mom doesn't consent to continuous fetal heart rate monitoring, you may want to talk to her and the physician may want to talk to her as well as about, about allowing intermittent auscultation of the fetal heart rate um, so that we can periodically assess fetal well-being. Um, you're going to document, assess and document the status of her membranes. Did she rupture spontaneously, which is SROM, or did we have to artificially rupture her? And then when she ruptures, what do we notice? Um, is her fluid, amniotic fluid clear? Is it cloudy? Is it yellow? Is it pea soup green? What do we see? And at the time of rupture, what was the fetal heart rate? <clears throat> Um, did she have a large amount of amniotic fluid, a moderate amount, scan amount? Basically, we're going to um, assess that. Vital signs, um, you're going to document her, con assess and document her contraction pattern. Um, you're going to do I's and O's on her. You're going to do vital signs per your hospital protocol. She's usually going to be NPO. Um, you, you're going to go in and out of her room pretty frequently. Um, sometimes patients may feel the need of you being there more so they uh, but you take your cues on your from your patient sometimes they they need a little bit of space but you're their primary nurse and as she progresses you're going to be in that room more um, keep in mind that the support person may be anxious they may be fearful they're, they may be tired you want to encourage their presence as well and respect their cultural norms and the family norms um, sometimes I like to encourage the support person to be a part of the process, so giving them a role, like showing them how to apply sacral pressure. Um, if mom is experiencing back labor or how to do back massage can be helpful. Um, there, We just, I would like to encourage them to be a part of the process so that they don't feel like they're, I want them to feel this is an important day for them as well. Um, these are some other things to just remember. We talked about it before, but we don't want the patient in the supine position. You want to remember fetal oxygenation um, and think about your comfort measures such as lighting. Sometimes turning the lights down um, and like if they want music on or they want the TV on, you support what they what they want. We want to try to keep her comfortable um, using cool, damp washcloths to her face. Sometimes her feet get cold, so putting socks on her. I try to keep the linens underneath her frequently changed because she may have a lot of secretions. I mean, you know, she may have leaking of amniotic fluid. Um, um, so we we want to try to keep the linens underneath her changed. Some patients, their mouth gets really dry, so frequent mouth care, like brushing their teeth, swishing their mouth, using 
using ice chips, um, hard candy um, can be helpful. And then keeping a status on that, that bladder. Remember I told you we, we frequently assess her, her bladder. Um, we don't allow, usually most facilities don't allow water burst, but they will allow her to labor in the water. But if they don't have a whirlpool, you, you can use a shower or, um, or if they have a laboring uh, pool, uh, like a tub, you can do that. Sometimes that's very, it makes mom feel a lot comfortable if she's, um, if she's experiencing labor. So that can be a comfort measure. Sometimes changing her positions frequently um, on her side, hands and knees. Also, some of that may be intervention based on what pattern you're seeing with the baby and their fetal heart rate. We do a lot of education. Um, I don't spend a whole lot of time going and lecture over the childbirth education. I put it there for you to, to um, kind of reference, but we talk to them about breathing patterns. Um, we talk to them about the difference between pharmacology, like in a lot of this happens in the childbirth education classes. So, um, but your patient may not have had childbirth education. So we talk to them about epidurals if they feel the need for an epidural or if they want um, a little bit of pain meds, they don't want an epidural, like they may want some Stadol or, or Nubane. We talk to them about that and we want to give your patient, you want to give your patient a lot of encouragement. You want to prevent injury. Um, there, you're going to keep in mind, you're going to be in a lot of communication with the, um, attending and, or the resident doctor who is ever delivering or the, the uh, midwife. Um, and most patients are in, when they're admitted to labor and delivery, that is the room they're going to deliver in unless they have to transfer them to the OR for a C-section. And when she gets close to delivering, you're going to position her for birth. So you're going to break down her bed into the delivering position. <clears throat> I want to briefly talk to you about emergency delivery by the nurse, meaning what do you do when you're it, <laughs> meaning um, delivery is happening very quickly and you may not have a lot of time to even get a patient to the room or you just get her into the room. This usually uh, is called precipitous delivery, but it usually, um, it, to have this this definition, it means from the time labor starts to the time delivery occurs is three hours or less. Um, and there are some contributing factors to this. This can be a woman who's had more than one baby before. She may have a weak pelvic floor or she has a large, um, a large pelvis and a small baby, women who've recently abused a cocaine, or some women, believe it or not, are really not aware of their their contractions. <clears throat> so the, a, a couple important things to remember, you, um, you're not pulling the baby out, you're basically catching, all right? If you can get her to pant or to kind of uh, uh, make these short blowing mo um, kind of method of breathing until you can get a doctor in there. That's great, but sometimes that doesn't work. Um, it, it, when the baby emerges, you know, obviously grab a pair of gloves and put gloves on, but um, if you need to suction the baby, you're going to suction the mouth and the nose. Check for the nuchal cord though. Before you, instead of worrying about the suctioning, check for a nuchal cord because the baby can self-strangulate if that cord is too tight around the baby's neck. Again, we're not pulling the baby out, you're just catching. So when the baby comes out, you're going to hold the baby close to the vaginal opening. Um, you're going to dry the baby off with warm blankets. Um, and, and the physician or OBGYN or our nurse midwife is going to come in and take over um, from, you know, where you caught the baby. <clears throat> This is kind of what a delivery room looks like. There's going to be an area for uh, the newborn to uh, do your care with the newborn. There's going to be neonatal resuscitative supplies. There's going to be a computer for documentation and there's going to be a birthing bed. This is kind of the the um, supplies that are on the um, the delivery table and it's draped in blue so it is sterile. 
um, but they're going to have um, hemostats, sterile scissors, they're going to have an umbilical cord clamp, a bulb syringe, they're going to have sterile uh, strips, and you have to count those just like you would for any other surgical procedure. They're going to have sterile drapes for both the midwife or the OBGYN to wear, so they're going to have some sterile uh, equipment. They're going to have a placenta basin as well. <clears throat> this is how um, a birthing bed breaks down. And so um, you can bring the patient into an upright position. You could actually, if she wanted to, to squat, we could put her into a squatting position as well with the birthing beds, but I'm just showing you how they break down. Um, so that, that's kind of what the setup looks like. Let's talk about the nursing care of the patient in the late intrapartum period. We're going to set up, when she's really close to delivering, you're going to set up the equipment. You're going to get meds as the doctor prescribes them. A lot of times, um, labor and delivery rooms may have those. They have like a special med cart that they pull into the room. So they'll have the meds that you need to pull out of that cart. And you're going to sign them off like you would do any other meds, medication. Um, and then you, once the baby's born, you're going to want to have a nurse, or as the baby's being born, I should say, you want to have a nurse in that room, at least one for baby and at least one for mom in case you know, both of them are experiencing complications. <clears throat> After birth, you're going to uh, recover, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to recover both mom and baby, watch that baby's airway, watch that baby as it transitions, um, you're going to support thermal regulation, we're going to band, we're going to do, you know, skin to skin care, we already talked about APGAR score um, and the normal newborn content. We're going to band mom and baby before they leave that room and so that the baby has at least two identifiers on them and that mom and, you know, um, dad or the significant other has the other band on. We're going to promote early family attachment and that's typically the first hour of birth and usually your baby friendly facilities require this. Um, we're going to assist mom with breastfeeding if she wants to breastfeed we're going to latch the baby on to breast right in the labor and delivery room um, we're going to observe her signs of attachment within that family we're going to start assessing right away and just be aware of cultural variations i don't lecture to the perineal education i put this content just for reference to you i mean it is testable but to, so you can kind of see what we teach them so it's here for me to remind you to just look over this in your handout it's in your handout it talks about the nature of pain um, adverse effects of excessive pain give you some non-pharmacological non-pharmacological breathing techniques and uh, that you can be used uh, in the labor and delivery process. I show you the different positions that we can put mom in. Um, I do want to talk about this. We would, let's talk about the different positions that we can put mom in for not over, not only labor, but also delivery. So she can be in an upright kind of um, squatting position or a standing position. She can be in a sideline position. We just don't want her flat on her back, okay? Um, and this is important. We, we learned a lot of this from research and some research actually came with midwives and um, because they were using a lot more of the upright position as, as opposed to the lithotomy position which you saw being used more with historically with um, physicians. <clears throat> what we found is the upright position actually can work it actually helps with the process of labor, it shortens the second stage of labor. Don't pay attention to these codes that are behind this. Let's just talk about the content that has to do with some referencing. But it shortens the second stage of labor. They have fewer assisted deliveries, such as vacuum assist or um, forceps assisted delivery. Fewer need for episiotomies. Fewer reports of severe pain. You have less abnormal heart rate patterns for the fetus as opposed to the lithotomy position you have more episodes of perineal tears and you have more episodes of of blood loss <clears throat> so the upper right the upright position really uses um gravity on your side so we do a lot of education with patients regarding this in the in the positions that you know they can be in during delivery and we encourage them to you know they don't have to just be in the supine we don't want them in the spine position but there are other positions that can help even if it's during um 
labor versus delivery. Like sometimes delivering, if the, there's some um, complications that are happening, they may want to put mom on her side or all on all fours, um, which is fine. We can we can have her deliver in those positions as well. So here's an example of a mom being on all fours. You can use the birthing ball or and she can use the squatting position, even using um, a squat bar or the birthing belt that I showed you for assistance. This is actually a midwifery birthing chair. So you can show you, show you that um, they can use the upright position. This was actually, again, bought to fruition by midwives. Um, water births don't happen as much anymore it's still an option in some but most hospital protocols have moved away from her actually delivering in the water they more are along the lines of letting her labor um, but when it comes to delivering having mom get out of the water for the delivery process um, these are the pharmacological pain management component to labor and delivery I don't have time to get to each one of these, but you kind of want to look these up. So there are some meds that you can use. I'm giving you an example. Demerol is one that could be used. It's not used as frequently as it used to be, but you can have Demerol, you can have Stadol, you can have Nubane um, being used. They can use uh, Finergan. They can use Visceral. We can give her an epidural block. The epidural block is usually used uh, for patients who want to have an epidural procedure for delivery. Um, a spinal block is usually used for a c-section delivery and a pedental block is a type of um, anesthesia that's given for a patient who's going to either have an episiotomy or um, they want to give her a local that's going to numb her perineum. We don't like to use general anesthesia. They only use that if there's like an emergency and they're going to, they don't have the time to do a spinal block because of the emergency. Um, and so they're going to put mom under general anesthesia. Typically we want much as possible to mom to be awake so she can participate in home delivery. But if an emergency arises and minutes count and they need to put her under general anesthesia, they will. C-section occurs when vaginal birth isn't uh, possible. Um, it is a surgical procedure. It requires a special setup. They're going to monitor both mom and baby, but it means instead of being born vaginally, the baby is going to be delivered through an incision that's made in mom's abdomen and an incision to her uterus. I talked to you guys about episiotomies under uh, in the postpartum content. Uh, this is just... Um, in the labor and delivery content we have to talk about it as well we don't historically use episiotomies as much as they used to they it's used if they need to shorten the second stage of labor or if they feel that there is um, a need for her to have an episiotomy you do not see episiotomies done as frequently as they used to be um, so routine episiotomies don't um, they don't prevent pelvic floor damage leading to incontinence as they used to be th thought to do. They don't. So if they have to, it's going to be very specific guidelines as to when they're going to use it. They can still uh, do this procedure. It is done, but not nearly as, as much as it used to be. And this is the end of this process for labor and delivery. Now there are, there is in Blackboard a list of um, procedures that I listed. It's on a separate of a form, but it correlates to this content. There is a list of procedures that um, that you've been asked to look up so that you further uh, understand this content. But this is the end of your labor and delivery lecture. Thank you.